This is the BBC. I travelled on a train from Chester to London the other day and on the table behind me, three men were talking about football. Now, if you weren't a football fan, you might possibly have thought they were important figures in the professional game because they talked about their club, Liverpool, as we. That's what true fans do. I do it. I say things like, we knocked it about nicely today and I'm referring to Arsenal. The only bit of playing I do is walk round the front room while my son tries to kick the ball between my legs, otherwise known as nutmegging, which he broadcasts to the neighbourhood with a huge shout of Megs or Nuts, or even the Spanish Pana. You see, it's not enough to play the game. You have to have the words to describe it. Back to the guys on the train. At the end of the day, said one, it's all about goals. Indeed, yes. The rules of the game state quite clearly that the team that scores the more goals wins. So why say it? Why repeat it? Because, unstated in that cliché, is the observation that Liverpool, right now, are good at scoring goals, but also rather good at letting them in. As the ex-player and commentator Paul Merson said on TV the other day, Liverpool have got it back to front, which did not mean that Liverpool's back players play at the front. No. Are you following this? Don't worry if you're not, because today we have with us someone to translate this kind of thing. It's Adam Hurry, who's written a book called Football Clichés, and he's here in the studio now. Hi, Adam. Hello there. Along with the not overly enthusiastic about football, Dr Laura Wright, Cambridge linguist. Hi, Laura. Although I do enjoy saying Hamilton academicals. And said beautifully, I must say. And Um, heart of Midlothian. Right, I think that's enough now, yeah. And Queen of the South. Oh, I thought it might go on. Um, Right, Adam, first of all. Are you an Arsenal fan or do you you support an inferior team? I was looking forward to this question and um, I'm happy to declare that I'm not an Arsenal fan, which may or may not disappoint you. But um, to maintain an air of professionalism, I'm not actually going to tell you who I support. Is it inferior? Um, Some may argue that they are (laughs) inferior. Um, I could happily talk for an hour about why they're not, but um, let's leave it at that. I liked your neutrality there. Professional neutrality was very good, yes. Now, you must spend an awful lot of time watching or listening to football. Do do the clichés and the the, the lingo that keeps repeating itself, does it drive you mad? No, not at all. Um, Whilst I do have a a very special interest in the the language of football, I I think clichés in general, not not necessarily just football clichés, serve a very important purpose. They're kind of like a conversational lubricant, if you like. They they fill the gaps where there is nothing to be said. And for football, there are a lot of gaps. The, the, The incredible amount of coverage, it's reached saturation point on TV and radio. And there's an awful lot being said about football, but there isn't necessarily more football to be talked about. So inevitably, clichés have to fill this gap where there is no original things to talk about. I've got an image there of candy floss, you know, where you, you stick the, the, the stick in and you collect the sugar and then it sort of gathers. I can sort of see football as sort of gathering clichés on the end of the, <laughs> the, yeah, end of the stick. Yeah, if you were being very cruel, you could say that it's essentially it's detritus. It, 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 it is utterly useless information that's being talked about. But once you bring it all together, you, you, you have football coverage. So clichés, as infuriating as they can often be, because clichés are, by definition, things Annoying. that lack, lack original thought. They, they, they don't bring anything new to the conversation. But by the same token, they're reassuring because they bring everyone into the conversation. Whether you don't know anything a lot about football and you're listening to this or you're listening to football coverage, you'll be able to be brought into the conversation. It's quite a democratic thing because clichés, they're all encompassing. They're, they may infuriate the purist, but they will enlighten the people who haven't. Any favourites? Any anti-favourites? Um, football clichés could be quite poetic. You often get ones that sound like they could be the subtitle to a Harry Potter book. Howls of derision, chorus of boos, uh, the corridor of uncertainty. Oh, which I is love the stolen from of cricket, I believe, um, I should begrudgingly say. Should, should we explain to listeners what that actually means? The corridor of uncertainty is as, as perilous as it sounds. It's the area between um, the goal line and possibly about eight yards out where if the ball is delivered from the side and the goalkeeper then has a decision to make, do I stay where I am or do I come out and try and get it? And that is why it's called the corridor of uncertainty because a lot of goals are scored that way through goalkeepers really not being quite sure about what they should do when the ball enters that area. So a favourite there. Any real anti-favourites at all? 
I'm not a fan of, of the euphemisms that football reporters use to describe a game that is essentially rubbish. It's, it's been a dreadful game, nothing's happened. Do they ever say it's rubbish and nothing no, happened? No, it's, no they, they want you to keep watching. That. No, it's, it's very oddly and conspicuous by its absence. I don't know why. I mean, there are for reasons of neutrality and all that sort of thing, but there is no reason why a football game cannot be described as bad. I mean, broadcasters have a vested interest in, in playing up a game. But what you end up with is um, games of football being um, described as chess matches. Um, which kind of adds which this kind not. of cerebral glamour to it, when really they're just lacking in endeavour. So and there's another one, isn't it? Cancelled each other out. Yeah, that's that's uh, to mean really, really dull game. Yes, and um, but sort of other euphemisms like intriguing, absorbing, and also cagey. Oh, As this t- is just like when um, you say to somebody and you you harangue on for about ten minutes, and then they look at you and they say interesting, exactly. And you know full well that they're not remotely interested. That's exactly what it's like. Yeah, yeah. I think I was denied by the woodwork there. Laura, is there anything new about this? Tell, tell us a bit about the past here. There isn't anything new as far as I can see. I mean, I had a look at some football commentary in the press uh, and I can see that one thing that's quite common is really basic nouns to do with the game will often be omitted. Yes. The ball, mm-hmm. football, mm-hmm. the team, that sort of thing you don't get very often. So um, you will find, and I'm quoting here, Ronaldo struck powerfully into the back of the net where the word the ball simply isn't there. Or, and would a, would, a, would a word like struck normally, you'd normally expect there to be a he struck something yeah, rather yeah. than just struck? Exactly, yes. I mean, unless you're yes. on strike, but there's different. Quite. Yeah. Neymar fired over the bar from 18 yards. You would expect him to fire something. But, of course, footballers and footballing aficionados know full well what they're talking about, so that unnecessary bit of the language is left out. And this has been going on for a long time. Here's um, a report of a grand cricket match between Hampshire and All England in June 1776. Are we happy about this slide into cricket here, Adam? Are oh, we, I will we... accept it for the moment, but okay. it's not my area of expertise. OK, carry on, Laura. The Duke of Dorset, who played in this match on the side of All England, caught out three, and among them Small and Ryland, but not till the former had won 45 and the latter 70. I mean, that's what it said in the yes. Times in the 1700s, but the thing is, I don't know 45 what... That, or 70 well, these watt, days, or that, caught out three watt. These days, caught out three men, and one, which we wouldn't normally say these days, would be runs, and the latter 70. So, um, yes, they don't, don't feel they have to say it. Because so. in the 18th century, what you actually get in cricket is notches. It will give the score mm. in notches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's also a way, isn't there, that fans actually like the clichés. They kind of savour them. I mean, after all, they are... Uh, how can I put it? Quick, portable ways to describe very complicated things. I always think when you hear someone say, oh, well, he picked the ball out of the net, that covers a kind of whole sense of misery. There's a whole way in which goalkeepers and the whole team, the heads go down. Another useful one. Yep. Um, the heads go down. So the misery is in the phrase, pick the ball out of the net. Because you don't have to say it. After all, it's completely irrelevant. It's nothing to do with the ball, nothing to do with the game. That's right. Well, there are there are some clichés that essentially are handy kind of short-form ways of explaining very complicated things or, or alternatively, concepts that would otherwise be described as, oh, you know what I mean. So let me give you some examples. Um, a, a very popular one, which is kind of almost passed into kind of post-cliché territory, which is good touch for a big man. Oh, yes. It Peter implies Crouch. that people perhaps over about six foot two don't have this kind of dexterity with their feet that perhaps smaller players would. So it's it's almost a surprise to people when someone say like Peter Crouch, who's six foot seven. He's big, he's red, his feet stick out of bed. Peter exactly, Crouch, yeah. I think, yes. Um, should be any good with his feet rather than just heading the ball. Mm. So um, good touch for a big man is, is kind of a backhanded compliment, but it... But it, it it explains what's quite a complicated kind of physiological um, situation. There is uh, a point in the game where it's a good time to score. Um, now, exactly. I know, Isn't that always? Well, yeah, that, that would be the, your instant response. Is there's never a bad time to score, but of course you can score too early. Mo- you can't really. Well, it's only what the commentators say, yeah, though, isn't it? Because well, no, you football... could win one nil by scoring in the first twenty seconds. Yeah, but, but f- football fans are very um, sort of pessimistic animals. If if they do score in the second minute, then that's it. That's it. They're going to score again. They'll come back and they'll they'll win two one. So there is actually a bad time to score. Now I possible. put a message out on a um, social media asking people for their favourite or their most unfavourite clichés, and I was literally unindated. The post bag was bulging, uh, rather like the un-indated. proverbial net. We were inundated. Did I say unindated? <laughs> un-indated. But maybe that's a, a footballing cliché. It could be. So let's have a Along look and see picking. what we've got. We've got Ruth Perry 
she says cynical. That's quite nice, isn't it? Nasty tackles can be cynical. Yeah, that these these are the sort of tackles that um, bring the, an at- opposition attack to a halt, and so it, it's deemed to be um, you know malice aforethought. It's it's a foul that was done very deliberately, and when it's committed, the the offender will hold his hands up and say, "Yep, yeah, fair enough." He'll take his yellow cards, take one for the team. Yes, and so yeah, it's it's the idea that this this a lot of thought had gone into that foul, and it wasn't just mere mindless violence, and not much to do with the school of Greek philosophy, the cynics. No, no not no. at all. And certainly not that deep. No, William Gould has got us. He's won a penalty, which actually is quite odd, isn't it? Because how can you win a penalty? Well, it... really, I mean, I, I know that it exists as an th- idea, but I mean, he didn't dive, he just won it. But you shouldn't really. Yeah, it's a very vague area because it, it, it plays into this kind of idea which, which the purists hate, is the idea that players might try and cheat their way to an advantage. But what winning a penalty is saying is they haven't deliberately gone and thrown themselves to the ground. They've just happened to make that foul happen by getting in the way. And then I I really like it at the end of the game. Um, Dan Wright has noticed this one. Um, We're just going to take it one game at a time. Well, you actually, you can't play two games at the same time. So that that is really genuinely a kind of empty cliché, isn't it? Well, it's it's part of an exclusive club of of clichés that have moved into a post-cliché situation. So when you hear anyone saying that, like a player, they will preface it with, I know it's a cliché, but we're taking this... (laughs) One game at a time, yeah. because yeah, there is only way one way to do it. So it's it's a truism that that has hung around because it just fills the gap. Now, Mr. MCA, he spotted that thing that um, well, first player, perhaps it was a manager who used it, as I remember, was uh, Kevin Keegan, I think. Anyway, where the, where the way that players' surnames become kind of plural nouns, so you get <laughs> your Gerards, your Beckhams. Um, sometimes a little bit more, a little bit difficult to say it, but some of the foreign names, your Agueros, it doesn't quite work, does yeah, well, it? Yeah, they, they also use it with with teams as well. Your Chelsea's. Oh, <laughs> this is another actually little detail about it. Not only do they pluralise, but they they some ownership comes into it. So it isn't just the Bergkamps, the Zolas. It's your Chelsea's, your Arsenal. Oh yes, and it's because it's. What are, my theory about this is that they're, they're offering padded out evidence for what it is they're trying to explain. And it's an oddly tolerated phenomenon in football. It's often lampooned, but people, people understand why they do it, because I, I often do it. I, I, I embrace this, this unnecessary pluralisation because I, what I'm trying to do is pad out evidence of, of the case I'm trying to put forward. And so if, if I can't think of another Chelsea, I'll just say It'll Chelsea's. Do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, let's have a little think. How did it all begin? Laura, have we always talked about football using cliché? Well, looking at early football commentaries in the press, they don't say enough about the match to warrant using clichés. Practically nothing that they actually said was about what went on Mm -hmm. in the pitch. Here's um, an England v Scotland match in the times of 1872. The afternoon was well adapted for football there being scarcely a breath of wind stirring. Nice literary cliché there, breath of wind. And when Stokes, the English captain, kicked off at 2.31pm, there were some (laughs) 3,000 spectators, including many ladies, present. As regards weight, the Englishman had far the best of it and bore a marked contrast to the nimble Scotchmen, whose running powers were, on the other hand, the fleetest. In other words, it's about... The wind, the afternoon, the fact that we're all having a pleasant time, there are some ladies present, the weight of the players. Um, There's very little about the play of the match. And when you look at all the sporting events in the 1800s and through into the 1900s, it's really about which important people were present. Were the gentry present or weren't they? That's what people wanted to read. But as a piece of writing, it sounds far more like kind of, uh, what we can call it, ordinary formal prose, whereas Mm. a lot of football journalism, particularly on the hoof, now uses words that we're maybe unlikely to hear in normal conversation. Do do you agree with that, Adam? Absolutely. Um, Football happily commandeers words for its own use, and to the point where... And I, I don't want to do football fans a disservice or their intellect a disservice, but it, but it gets to the point where you hear words in football that these people would never use in other areas of life. I'll give you some examples. Um, a goal can be scored with a plomb, which is a wonderful word, a beautiful-sounding yes. word, but I've never used a plomb anywhere else in my life, and I don't think I'd ever would. Sounds like it's heavy with lead. I mm. don't know whether it is. It does, yes, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes a plomb. Mm, yeah. and, um, Another one? 
Uh, in the transfer market, if, if a club tries to uh, tries to make a, an offer for a player for another club and it's, it's deemed to be insufficient, there's often a public statement by the supposedly selling club who will describe the bid as derisory. Ah, yes. Um, and it's always used. And it, it pops up all the time, and, it, and it's not quite passed into this kind of self-aware territory. I'm thinking there are others, aren't there? I mean, you concede a goal. That's quite a sort of posh word to say, just yeah. a goal went well, in. You concede it. And, and another... If you conceded it, you presumably didn't concede it anyway. It happened by accident, didn't it? You were trying to prevent it. Well, often, um, if, if a team scores an own goal, I really like this one, when a team scores an own goal, um, newspaper reports often describe it as so-and-so conspiring <laughs> to put the ball into their own net, as if there was some sort of underhand <laughs> oh, conspiracy like going that. on. Why it's not? amazing, because, because so that's the opposite of what happened. So they against their own team. Yeah, it's amazing, because conspiring is exactly what didn't happen there. They did it by mm. mistake, and there was, no, there was no forethought into it. So it's entirely the wrong phrase, but yet it still gets used. And you've got some uh, collective nouns there for chances and winning goals. Absolutely. Um, football is full of um, very colourful collective nouns. You can have a raft of substitutions, a <laughs> string of saves, yes. a goal glut. Yeah. And um, some of my favourite ones are, include a catalogue of errors, um, which, which is terrible for whoever's made these errors because it implies that there's this big book listing of all the terrible things they've done on a football pitch or the hapless things they've done on a football pitch. If you score a couple of goals, it's described as a brace, but uh, if you want to be more colourful about it, you can call it a two-goal salvo, which I love. A oh, salvo. Yes. I love a salvo. And you can have a hat full of chances, can't hat you? Hat chances, a flurry of yellow cards. Oh, yes. Well, they are sort of... That's true, though. He does flurry them, doesn't he? Well, I mean, there they, is they a... brandish them. Flourish. Oh, they brandish. Flourish. You're mixing flourish. up flurry and flourish. Well, I do. Yes. A, yes. a yellow card is one of the few things in life you can brandish other than, say, a machete. <laughs> yes, very good. Brandishing is good. And so Ace, tell us of... about Ace. Um, Ace is a very interesting word. Um, it, it came into popularity because it's just very short and therefore suits newspaper headlines or indeed um, on the much-missed CFAX, which no longer exists anymore. But, I loved uh, It was wonderful. And um, Ace has a rich history and um, it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, I, I often used to associate it with World, World War II flying sort of pilots. They used to be known as flying aces. Douglas so, Harder was a flying ace. Yeah, exactly. So, so, the, so the definition of an ace is, someone, is an elite class performer of a certain discipline. Mm. But what it's, what it's come to mean in football is simply someone who plays football, who happens to have got themselves into a bit of mischief outside of the game. I don't, I don't know. They have to be a professional footballer, don't they? You mm. can't have your local butcher who happens to I don't clog know. it round on a it, Saturday and call him an ace. No, it's evolving to the point where it used to mean someone who was good at football, then it became someone who simply played football. Now it's got to the point where it, it isn't any, anyone well-known at all. It just happens to be someone who's got a bit of mischief out. Um, off the pitch, and for reasons of, of attracting people to this kind of non-event of a story, they're described as an ace when they're not. And um, but it feeds into this kind of overarching theme in football of hyperbole, uh, and where football is really beginning to eat itself because it's using unhelpful words like ace. That would be a great really team, though, wouldn't it? Hyperbole United, they would be good. Wouldn't they? <laughs> One of the ace Scottish ace. ones. Yeah, it, well, hyperbole that... academicals. Yes, is it is it new ace? No, it's been around since the 1700s at least to mean an expert. And as Adam just said. It then had a vogue with those flying aces from 1913 onwards. Yeah. But I haven't heard it used of just anybody doing something, which is more or less where you say it's come to now. In its most unhelpful guise, it's sort of um, maybe a player who, who's fallen on hard times, fallen from grace. Oh, an ex-ace. Well, you described as, say, an ex-England ace. So you look at this headline and think, well... Oh, yeah. Wow, he could be he could be good, and it turns out he played for England under 18s back in 1994. He was once. an ace, and um, so it's just a very unhelpful term. Now let's talk about verbs. Okay, so we know when we listen to commentary, there's somebody commentating the game as it's going on, and then we have the summariser, who quite often describes what we've just seen, or on the radio, of course, what's just been talked about, and quite often the person who's describing it, this summariser, will say. Messi passes to Rosen and Rosen scores. Rosen now that's, scores. Yeah, all right, OK. Um, like a little bit of glamour I was looking for there. Anyway, so, so what we have there is that it's sounding almost as if it's happening now, but it didn't. It happened 30 seconds earlier. Is that odd? Is that strange, Laura? So using a present tense usage for something that's just happened. Literally a moment before. Messi Actually, passes it's the to same... Rosen and Rosen scores. Now, isn't the commentary while it's going on? It's just happened. I want you to notice that I didn't use a questioning intonation there. Rosen scores? <laughs> you did a bit. Um, it's the same thing as when, for example, you get home at the end of the day and you want to tell your wife what happened to you and you could say, well, so she came up to me and she says to me... 
frozen scores. She says to me, what you're doing is you're kind of bringing the present Mm -hmm. into the moment, even though it actually happened earlier on. Now, there's another one that people say. They might say, and Philip Pullman, uh, he tweeted on this one. Um, (laughs) He said... Um, you know, it might be something like Messi has passed to Rosen and Rosen has scored. So it's the same thing, the summariser. So the summariser has actually got mm. a choice. He, it's mostly he, all right, will say either Messi passes to Rosen or Messi has passed to Rosen and Rosen has scored. He's got that in his armoury and sometimes mix the two. It might be Messi passes to Rosen and Rosen has scored. You might mix it up in the same sentence, mightn't they? I mean, have, have you heard that? I'm fascinated by this. Um, I... I call it the goal scorer's tense because I most commonly hear it in post-match interviews with a with, with player who scored a goal in the game. And what the interviewer does is they essentially ask that player to relive what they've done. So this player is now forced to describe this goal and it, it's crept into these post-match interviews with this kind of present perfect tense. And he says that he'll say something like, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've just hit it and thankfully it's gone in. So they they know that they're they're being asked to essentially recount something that's just happened, and in their head they are reliving it. So they speak as if they are reliving it. So it becomes something that's happening now. So they're not saying I scored using the simple past. No, so they're exactly. not saying I scored or you know he passed it to me and I scored. He says he's passed it to me they, and I've scored. They hardly ever say it like that, and it's so weird because that's the natural way that anyone would would say something that happened in the past, even if it was very recent. So you get this quite on the face of it, quite awkward tense. But for football fans, it's very natural. So it's almost like reheating the moment, as yeah, it were. Exactly. Re- I like warming that. Reheated it over. football. It's good. This is something also that I can find in earlier writing. I looked at the times of a football match of 1872, and it says... England now began to keep the ball unpleasantly close to their opponent's goal. The English forwards now began to play up better. So those two nows, even though it's going with began, clearly Mm. that's a past tense usage, presumably trying to bring it into the present, trying to make it more immediate. Now I think about it, I I use the word now quite a lot in whenever I've written a match report, but also I know I've written a lot of retrospective pieces which might go back 20, 30 years and I'll still use the word now because I'm trying to recount something that's kind of running in my head, even if it happened 20 or 30 years ago. So it may well be kind of slightly awkward way of doing it, but now it serves a purpose of bringing everyone into that moment. I don't think it's awkward. I think it's just part of the material you've got Mm. for doing that particular action of getting something in the past into somebody else's brain Mm. in the present. Because people are obsessed with moments in football. And one refinement to this, Roger Jarman tweeted... Now, this is, again, we've got to bear in mind, this is the summariser, so we've just seen that. What we've just seen is a footballer miss. So the summariser says he scores that and it's all over. So what he's saying is if he had scored that, the game would have been over because there'd have been 3 0 up or something like that. But ah, he so compresses it. Well, he's a missing if, and also he's saying he scores that and it's all over as if it's right now. But of course, it's if he had. Yeah. If he had done it, so now then he's... it would have been. So we've got a conditional in there. But not in the not in the sentence. I so, mean, it's brilliant. It's so compressed, isn't it? But let's have a let's have a think of something slightly different here. Does everyday speech sometimes borrow from football commentary? Have you have you found examples of the way that it's it's kind of filtered through? Surprisingly, looking into this for this program, I found that it was mostly a, a one way street. Football will happily take any words it likes for its own use, but it doesn't pass much back the other way. Perhaps, you know, society doesn't have much use for football terms. I like the, the passing bit there, by the way. Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> there are there are possible examples um there's a very kind of alan partridge phrase which is back of the net which he popularized and uh, it's now uh, back of the net which is essentially a football phrase to describe a goal that has been scored and the ball is indeed in the back of the net um <laughs> is now used as a triumphant celebration for something that's been completed you know you, you've won something maybe it be at work or wherever Back of the net. Is, back of the it's net. A, it's a celebration. Yeah. But oddly enough, in football now, has, hasn't got much use for back of the net. If during a, a live report you hear, and the ball is in the net, 90% of the time I can guarantee you that that, is, that goal has been disallowed. Because there are 101 ways of, of describing how a goal has been actually scored. But if you hear the words, and the ball is in the net, I'm afraid that you're, you're often going to find seconds later that the flag is up and that it's offside has been adjudged.
This reminds me of Get In. Now, that must be football. I notice now comedians do it. All sorts of people do it. If you just do something, I don't know, if you the toaster, it could be anything, couldn't it? You just go, get in. Well, my instinct for that, uh, the origins of get in is presumably you're willing the ball to go in the net, get yeah. in there. Yeah. So, uh, again, it's, it's, it's moved into wider society to, to celebrate something. And um, there's another one which perhaps is about to move into wider usage. Um, in football, if you're offering an opinion, which is also usually quite a dangerous thing to do, it's important to kind of preface it with for me, as in oh, yeah. I am giving you my opinion and you're you are you are offering that caveat straight away. So for saying, me it was a penalty all day. Exactly, exactly. And and uh, added on to this has been for me Clive. Um <laughs> and, it, and, and so people say, Well for me Clive and it's used quite ironically. Uh, it it originates from Clive Tilsley, who used to commentate alongside Ron Atkinson on ITV, and Ron Atkinson would always say, you know, for me Clive, so and so and so and so. So <laughs> so a lot of people will say, you know, for me Clive, but then they'll offer an opinion utterly irrelevant to football. They say, For me, Clive, you know, that film wasn't very good. So can you teach me how to use it? Can I could I say to you, for example, if we were working and we were bored, can I say, Well, for me, Clive, it's now time for a cup of tea? Or does no, it have to be something a little bit more? You're offering po- an opinion. Offering a little bit and more of a, a value be... judgment on something for me clive the tea's cold i see yeah even though it's just even though so you just poured the kettle on. yes exactly and and you're view. you're softening the blow by saying for me this is just my opinion clive whoever clive is and then you say then, something then, that's absolutely obvious you, to all and sundry well not necessarily you, you could be offering quite a controversial opinion um but that those three words at the start will always soften that blow and then you deliver the dagger the ref didn't give a penalty but the summariser or the commentator says, for me, that was a penalty all day, or even all day long. Yeah. Yes. You know, in summary, for me is quite an unnecessary thing to use. Mm. It, you, we know it's your opinion. You are talking. We can hear your voice. Yeah. I've taken to using subbing on. So I say, for example, if there's a someone, I'm, I'm doing a performance, there's someone who's just been on before, and then I'll come up, and maybe the first things I say when I hit the microphone is, I've just been subbed on, or I've been subbed on for Roger McGough, or something like that. Right. Um, I quite like that. So, Alan, do other countries have football cliché equivalents? They must do, surely. Absolutely. Um, other countries who, whose languages are far more beautiful than ours... Um, have, Never! <laughs> they have well, they have quite poetic ways of describing football. Um, Brazilian Portuguese, for example, has some wonderful phrases that they use. Uh, where the owl sleeps. Oh. And I, I invite you to take a guess about where the owl sleeps, what it means. Um, I don't know. Sounds like his head under his wing? No, uh, where the owl sleeps is the Brazilian Portuguese equivalent of our postage stamp. That is the very, very extreme top corner of the goal. And and it and it. But postage stamp is wonderful. Postage stamp come in in the last few years. Owls are better than stamps. Well, also Brazilian Portuguese. um, They have a phrase "mal de afas." which translates as lettuce hand. So if a goalkeeper happens to let a, a shot, you know, through his grasp, he's described as lettuce hand, which is quite cruel. Well, we used to say butter fingers. That was, that was poetic. Yeah, you, you, could almost, you could construct a whole sandwich with ways of, de- <laughs> of, of describing how a, a goalkeeper's failed to, to stop a goal. Well, it's been wonderful. In fact, it's a bit of a cliche to say this, but I'm over the moon to have spoken to you, Adam Hurry. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, what a wonderful way to, to end it. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was a penalty. Well done.